Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. Hi everyone. As mentioned in this episode, I heard about Corey and the excellent work she does long before I met her. Once I met her, I immediately decided that I liked her. Corey is regarded as one of the top therapists in the field of compulsive sexual behavior in South Africa, which is, for obvious reasons, quite close to my heart. When I learned that she studied under Dr. Patrick Carnes, she virtually obtained saint status in my head. It took me a while to scrape the courage together to ask her to talk to meet me in the field. I am very grateful that she agreed though, and was seriously looking forward to get to know her a bit better. As you will hear during our chat, Corey is a beautiful, soft and caring soul, whom I'm very grateful to introduce to you today. This podcast is supported by The First Layer, the 12-step workbook on working through the 12 steps in any addiction in 21 sessions. There is also a 24-day step coaching and counseling program available based on The First Layer. For more information in this regard, go to www.freddy.org.za and click through from the notices at the right of the homepage. This is Corey's journey. Sit back and enjoy. Corey, welcome to Meet Me in the Field. Thank you. This is a wonderful opportunity. I am very, very, very happy to talk to you. I was thinking about it. I've known about you for a very long time. But then we only virtually met. We met one morning very quickly when I was doing my my internship. And you came to do dancing at the treatment center where you, oh you teach what type of dancing or you bio do dancer. bio dancer. Bio dancer. That's Let's right. start right there. What right. is bio dancer dancing? Bio dancer is a form of it's music and movement coming together and in that you um, there's no step that you follow there's no sequence of steps it's not an exercise I find it sometimes easier to say what bio dancer is not than to say what bio dancer is, but it's basically dancing your dance, the dance of life that is within you. So whatever you feel, whatever right. you want to do on that sound, that's what you do on that's that sound. Yeah, yeah, and it's something that that grows in us. It's as we connect more with our instinct, as we become more integrated in ourselves, we become more confident. Because if anybody have ever, would have ever told me that I would have done dancing or that I would have been an instruction instructor in dancing I would have laughed I would be so embarrassed I would have it was a blomiki tini me I would never have done it so it was it was and it was it's one of the most a friend of mine was talking is this your path or is it your medicine now this has been both both my path and medicine okay. and once I had my medicine it became I think my path so and where did you get to know about it I was in a, a group therapy group for about five years and we went twice a year on a retreat and uh, at, after one retreat, a silent retreat, um, I said to the lady, my therapist, I said, I'm left with the thought that I am pregnant, but it was in the Afrikaans word that we use for animals. So I, I had the words ek is Ah, like what a nice word, yes. yes. It, 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 for the English people it basically means that you're carrying something. Yeah, yeah. you're definitely ready to birth something. Yes. And a quite on an instinctual level. And the second thing is that I need exhilaration in my life. And she said, you know, I heard about this. I don't even know what the word is. I think it's something with bio and dance or something. And so I joined a group and it was... Uh, in those years, it was in, in in the northern suburbs in Belleville area, Durbanville area, and when I stood there on the dance floor, all my stuff was there with me, and so I've learned to to move with music through stuff. Um, okay, been very healing for me personally. Mm. So yes, that's where we met because I then became an instructor and. I was using it in treatment centers for yes. patients to connect with feelings. So that's the first time that, that you met. I remember in that treatment center, I was invited with the clients to do 
body stress release. Right. And I was so embarrassed, as I would be with, with biodance. And I said, I don't want to do it. And then I thought afterwards, you know, it's very open-mindedness. Mm-hmm. But I asked to be at the back of the class where the clients couldn't, couldn't see me. And I'm so happy that I did that. Yes. So it's normal for people to do, do biodance yes. and to be very self-conscious in the beginning. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because you think everybody's looking yes. at me. And, and they know how insecure I am and that... And of course, that's all the stuff that's in our heads that's got to do with us. It's got yeah. nothing to do with anybody else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like I always say to people in fellowship meetings, when they say they do shy to speak, I say, no, frankly, let's be completely honest. We're also in our own heads while we're sitting there. Nobody's really listening to you. Yeah. You can just shoot your mouth off. Yeah. <laughs> the odd one might catch something and reflect back, but there's yeah. nothing to be embarrassed about because nobody really listens to yeah. you. Like there, it's okay to dance as you wish because nobody watches. Yeah. <laughs> and as you grow in that in that coming into yourself and the acceptance of yourself where you are your fitness level now your body now your life stage now the aches the pains wherever you are the intrusive thoughts uh, it's it's wonderful the freedom that comes with that i still at times struggle to get myself at two a class and then when i'm there i know when i'm done with the class i think oh thank goodness i've come because this is why I need to do this. Okay, it's cool. so good for me. I was actually looking to that in up in my area as oh. well because I was meditating oh. the other morning and I don't know why this thing came up for me. I suddenly felt sad because I, I couldn't reflect with what brings me fun. Right. I have a very serious problem with play. Yes. Yes. I can't connect with a, with a playful part of life. So maybe that is something that I need to look at. That for me was a big, big thing. I don't know at what stage... In my life, I'm now 58. Ah, so we <laughs> was a stall pair of them. Yeah. Very much the same age. But at some stage, very, very late, I realized um, that I've integrated trauma into my body and into my psyche and that I could do life and, and I could do problems and I could do pain and I could do that endurance race. Yes. That was, it wasn't even a thought... I didn't realize, I truly didn't realize that there was life outside of that and that one could integrate uh, not just the trauma and the unexpected and everything that goes with that and addiction stuff and surviving that, but you can actually integrate, that was a whole new door I had to go through, exhilaration, joy. The other side of the coin, which I yes. always, always refer to. Everything is to, you need to flip the coin over and see what's on the other side. That is, an, and, and that for me in terms of recovery and development and moving also spirituality is the unexplored within me and within uh, the life. And, oh. and so I, I went to do the Camino, a, a bit of the Camino. And Which I'm, one? The, sp- the, 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 French the Spanish French one. The Spanish one. The yeah. Spanish one. I, I did a bit of that. Oh, cool. And I had an interview with a client the other day. Who did that? Specifically on, on that. Oh, that. I'm still looking for somebody who's done the Hajj to talk to me about that. Yes, that I haven't done. Yeah, so I'm looking for... So if you know of somebody who did the Hajj and they're willing to talk to me, let me know. Yes. I'm looking for somebody. <laughs> that also followed out of the therapy, the group therapy. The, the Camino. The Camino. And then... I am so excited. Next week I'm going to, and I, I, I always have this slip of the tongue, I'm going to dance with the dolphins. I'm going to swim with the dolphins. Oh, wow. And that also came out of that period of knowing that I have to shift. I can't just live. I have to, to make life worthwhile. I need to explore this other side Excellent. and integrate it. Yeah. So it continues to be this thing of being awake in life and not to go into unconsciousness, uh, which is very much part of the old stuff of childhood and of a way of being in this life. Um, It takes a lot to stay present and to push myself to integrate the other stuff as well. Okay. So by Danza, the Camino, and now the Dolphins, we Please got to <laughs> somewhere here or Mozambique. Mozambique. I just want to say Mozambique is a fan. Oh, I'm so jealous. Yes. Oh, well, at, at least yes. while you're there, I will be in the game reserve. So, yes. Which is for me so much part of my Wonderful. spirituality. If you want to have the happiest bunny in paradise, put me somewhere with a view with a book, and every time I can look up and look at animals, 
you know. felt and everything. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a water baby. I'm a Pisces, but I don't like water. Is it? Oh no, yes. I love water. I I think it is that this that is bigger than me is holding me. Oh. And it is just the most wonderful feeling to be held and something bigger than me that can hold me. <laughs> I so don't for know. You, I think that's for you, to do that's with safety. It. Yeah. For yeah. me that's scary. It did, yeah. yeah. That that's yeah. weird. Corey, you grew up Afrikaans. I grew up very Afrikaans in a little village, the Dwerums, the X River Valley. Oh, and what I a always beautiful say, place. Beautiful, beautiful, mm. beautiful. And I always say in those days and I don't know this that these days I can't speak for now, but it was the Ingrid Kerk and Absa Bank in Volkskasbank. Volkskasbank, that's yes. right, that's right, Volkskasbank, yes. Uh, and and the Ingekerk in the Ingekerk in in <laughs> in the apteek in the bibliotheek and in in the corporatie. Yeah. So I, I I grew up a very um, small in my world view. Yeah, I grew up small in terms of those things. Um, it was only later that my eyes opened to the bigger world. Yeah. Did you know Nelson Mandela was when you grew up? No. I'm so glad to hear that because neither did I and I was so embarrassed to acknowledge to people yeah. that I didn't know who this was. No, I didn't. I I don't even think in the trick I knew. So the indoctrination worked. Oh, no. <laughs> they were no, very, very good absolutely. at that. I was, I, I was a strange, I wasn't in the food trackers. I wanted to be? Yeah. My brother was, he was much okay. younger and my aunt had fought Spiele. Oh yes, I'm telling the trick. that. Loved it because that was the social thing. That yes. is where you met and did socialize and so on, meet people and so on. And then later there was in the in the high school definitely yeah we started with folk street in the Monday mornings and we had other things and then there was cadetta mm. which was sort of to do with yes. very mo- military training and oh god I did that yeah. oh. We had to wear these little brown units. Yes, yes, that's oh right. my god! I forgot about that actually. I Where think that's part of my trauma in my life. Yeah. <laughs> just my body language while I'm while I'm doing that. I'm holding yeah. my head and basically in the fetal position. It's just that yeah. most awful thoughts about those things. I don't know when I heard uh, at at university there was uh, the Ops Thunder. There was the riots, and it was. Uh, that was when I became aware of the world is a little bit dear Makar. The world was really shaking and yeah. moving. Why do I think you studied social, social work? Social, social work, work. Yes, yes. Yeah, in some way, yeah. Stellenbosch. Stellenbosch. I okay. started my, my pre grad at Stellenbosch in my honours and then later did my UCT, my master's there. Okay. So you grew up in Ingego? Yes. Did religion resonate with you? Um, Very much. I think because I, I grew up in a home of alcoholism. My father, who was my mentor and uh, with whom I had a very strong attachment, um, which is so interesting, the, the non-healthy one becoming the, actually the one that you attach to, uh, he was also my spiritual uh, mentor. And we had a very strong bond there. So church uh, was like a refuge for me in, okay. in times when it was very conflicting and chaos and I didn't know what was happening. So it, it was very important in my development. So and it was a safe haven for you, sorry. For, for me, definitely, yeah. yeah. I, I think something that... So I think it, it's wonderful if that can be it. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. So I didn't have the negative responses to church that I've never been the rebe- the rebel because mm. I was the good girl I was yes. a little social worker as so well <laughs> yeah yeah it was only much later that I started to actually much later that I started actually veering off and exploring uh, different ways of expression of spirituality and yeah because the feeling I'm getting as I'm sitting in your consulting room is what will be the word I see scented candles. I see a be- I love that statue, by yes. the way. Um, so I get the feeling your spirituality is not based in religion at the moment. No. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And absolutely. What would you say it is based in? I went through 
a divorce in 1996-1997 and I think it was so, so traumatic for me that separate from my father's death, my, my divorce was because I loved the man and there was alcoholism and it was such a, I remember one night driving over the pass and I didn't have words anymore to pray and the only prayer that came to me was the prayer when I was very, very young uh, again, Afrikaans, Lieve Jesus, ek is klein, maak my hartje rein. Something yes. like, Little Lord Jesus. Maak my net a goed en sterk vader om vir u te werk, ja. <laughs> it's something like, Little Jesus, I'm small, make my little heart uh, pure. Yes. Something like that. And I knew... So that was surrender. <laughs> and in that moment, I knew I didn't have to pray anything anymore. And there was some release and freedom for me to move from that, that... Everything else can move, but I know what is solid. I know, and it wasn't religion. Okay. And so then I started looking at silence and retreats and, you know, I explored further. So where I'm now at this stage is at a very comfortable place in myself and I'm, I'm also out of church. I cannot... And I'm not angry with church. I'm not not at all. I just feel there needs to be a new season, and I'm I'm waiting for that. Oh, cool. <laughs> the integration again will have to be in a new season. But I'm very comfortable where I am now. Yeah. And yeah. so, so I suppose when you say if you look around, it is not a one specific thing expression. It it will have to the next will have to be will have yeah. to e- evolve. You said something really interesting earlier about the unknown, the unexplored. Mm-hmm. And one of the conversations I had on here was with, and I call him the 76er. Mm-hmm. Because of the fact that only 24% of the universe is apparently known. The rest is stuff, stuff like dark matter and, 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 and. And he lives his life in more will be revealed. Mm, mm. And it sounds as if that's nearly where you are as well. You're waiting for the more to, to yes. be revealed and you're ready yes. for it. <laughs> I'm ready for it. That, uh, that was quite frightening to, to open the veil and to acknowledge that it's more than what I've received. Not all that I've received was needed, will we say that, or was <laughs> so pure or was even holy, or whatever. Not all was helpful. Okay. But, uh, that, and, and once one can accept that, that culturally there was the infestation of the religion, and of even of spirituality, and that I needed to, to come back to the basics, and then say, okay, but then um, there's more. And once that that was took quite a lot of courage because I didn't want to move out of the will of God. I didn't want to misstep because you see I'm a good girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to do something wrong. Yes. And there seems to be very little guidance up from a certain point onward. Yeah. Because I suppose we're not children anymore. We now have to take that ownership. It's quite scary because we've been indoctrinated quite a lot about there's right and there's wrong and it's black and white and increasingly I know that's not yes. it's not like that. So I love the words of your podcast between right and wrong. What did you say? Not right beyond and right doing and wrong right doing. Wrong. There is a field. I'll meet you there. Yes, and that is that space. And that is that space. And so today I work, I can really sit with fundamental Muslims or fundamental Christians, or over the top, other side, out, or (laughs) Catholics that have gone that way, or Catholics that's gone that way. Mm -hmm. And I'm truly, truly, truly uh, very comfortable with that, but very comfortable with that. So, yeah, that is also a journey to start seeing the expression of the good of life and the divine in in many different things. Yes. not just in this way, not just in this narrow way. Yeah. Absolutely. Now you, back to Vasti, so you did a master's in, in, in social work mm. and you're currently working as a 
counsellor, a therapist. What do you call yourself? I'm a clinical social worker. Clinical social worker. And so at heart I am a social worker, but... And I'm in private practice, which is something that uh, is fairly new. Yes. Uh, fairly, I mean, it's been for a while, but uh, I mean, there's not a lot of social workers in private practice. Yeah. And there's not a lot of social workers doing clinical work. Yes. Yeah. And you specialise in addiction. Addiction, yes. In, so mostly I'm, in sex addiction. Yes, I'm, so uh, relatively a lot, few years ago, about 10, 15 years, the time flies, I went to America and, and did some training in sex addiction. How did that come to be? This is this is now you know about talking about doors that open where there's not even a door. And this <laughs> is where the spiritual stuff comes in for me. So I had a client who came in with um, alcoholism, and he did binge drinking. Uh, he went and when he went to Johannesburg for business, very wealthy client. When he went to Johannesburg for for business. He would unfortunately binge drink and would then find himself in uh, linking with prostitutes. And at that stage, I and a lot of us didn't even know about sexual compulsion. And then, the long story short, um, he stopped his binge drinking but continued, and obviously more painfully for him without the alcohol. Yeah, because now you didn't have the excuse of alcohol. That continued and that was mesmerizing. And then... He found Dr. Patrick Carnes on the web, and uh, Dr. Patrick Carnes is sort of the father of sex addiction. Mm, and he, because he's wealthy, he went to America and he came back and he said, Corey, I can now make a long story or short story, you have to go for this training. And it was so humbling and uh, so weird that a so client. So you immediately bought into it that you, yes, you agreed? Yes, you, you... I, I realized. Okay. Yes. And Dr. Kahn's uh, in training talked that our clients are just ahead of us all the time because the field is exploding so quickly that if just when we think we've caught up, the technology brings new stuff. Uh, and, and so I felt a little bit, it, it was a weird thing for me, but I just knew it was the right thing to go. And so I went and I came back and I did training of therapists for this field. And I continue to do that because it was such a blessing. But within three months, my life and my practice completely changed very rapidly um, to about 80% of my practice became around sexual Whoa. compulsion and sexual... As a woman therapist 15 years ago specializing in sex addiction, surely mm. that must have been frowned on? Or not? I don't know <laughs> or, or, what... Or am I just, just being a conservative, a conservative Afrikaans man? <laughs> Very, because of, I think, this is not my story, my, what, that I've got in my head, my narrative that I've got yes. in my head, whether that's true or not. Because I had such a good uh, relationship with my father, and because my father was had his own issues and his dark issues, I am very comfortable with men with problems. Okay. And because I'm not a sexual object, whether that's in my mind or not, uh, my narrative is that I'm actually not available. It, so for me, the, I'm being the mother figure is very easy. That role didn't take a lot. And somehow men feel comfortable because they don't have to jump through other hoops. Okay. I have had men who come who said they, sh they went to this and this therapist, my sister's sexy. They can't <laughs> cope with that. Or she's got, uh, the one came back and said, no, that woman has got such a husky voice. And they can't <laughs> cope with that. So... So, so what I think where I do get it is men who come and, and, and feel that they have, and that's usually sometimes about very fundamental Christians that in any case find the problem, the, 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 the issue very difficult to deal with, that they sometimes prefer a male counsellor. Um, yeah. So I don't know why they come, but they come. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you're obviously bloody good at what you do because your you, your name was way ahead of your face for me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew about you long before I met yeah. you, and all in a very good context. So. Yeah. It, I think it's difficult to come for therapy, but I think this specific area is very difficult to talk about. Yes. But I find among men such an openness and such they call a spade that's why I love working with men they call a spade a spade women 
because of the added thing of shame, uh, an extra layer of shame, and men carry the shame, but it's as if women have... It's like the, in the 60s or earlier when women alcoholics was really seen as sluts and people that's very bad mothers, you know. Mm. It, it's just so unacceptable for a woman to have an alcohol problem in those years. And today, of course, it's so unacceptable for a woman to have a, yeah. a sex problem. So I find the women have layers and layers of intricacy that's still there. But men are so open and so yeah. ready. It's a really a privilege. So the stigma still has to be addressed big time. I, I remember as a fellow in, in, in sex addiction, um, we tried to get a women's only group going mm. because we, we thought we saw the need mm. and it didn't take off. Mm. It, we had to close the group, it couldn't sustain itself, which was yeah. really, really sad. I, I still find, and I do women groups, I still find, I do the two types of women groups. I do the women who are the partners of male sex addicts, and then I do women who have sex addiction or sex and love addiction. But I find those difficult groups to pull together, to hold together, and to to, to really for them to focus on the real sexual acting act, because... That it's easier to work with them with a love addiction or the romantic addiction. Yeah. They're more open to that, the codependency stuff. It's difficult for them to go into their own acting out and uh, boundaryless around sexual connection. Yeah. So, so I, I find I find myself then in this place, and just maybe to share that, where I was sitting in Collins's training, and I said to somebody next to me. It is so weird. On the one hand, I'm working with sex addiction, and on the other hand, I, I'm, 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 I'm dancing by Danza into freedom <laughs> of the sexual and not the sexual repression. And she said, yes, but um, it's like the cross. It's like, it's something, it's the heart. Yeah, that's what she said. It's the heart in the middle that holds the two poles. Oh, oh. oh I beautiful. like that, yeah. Very beautiful. And I think... If I don't have both poles, I think something will be missing for me. Balance will be, yeah. will be gone. And I think for long I didn't have the side of the, the pleasure and the, the enjoyment and the passion for life. And th I'm so thankful. Awesome. That I have that now. Kuri, yeah. what did you find on the Camino? Because the, it is so, mm -hmm. so weird because I do this podcast on spiritual journeys, but it never crossed my mind to talk to people who's done a physical spiritual journey until mm. my husband said to me, but why don't you do this? Oh my God, yeah, I could. Yes. So you will now be the, what did you find? It? Was it spiritual? For me, it was an a, a incredible spiritual pilgrimage. And, oh, I learned so much. We can have a whole podcast just about this, but... I'll tell you the beginning of my Camino, um, I prepared, I learned a bit of Spanish and the guy that was learning Spanish with me, when I left he said to me, he gave me a mantra, let it go, let it happen, let your heart not be troubled. Oh. It was a beautiful mantra and so I went with this mantra and when I landed in Pamploma and I got up to take my something out of the cabin at the top of the plane, something audibly snapped in my calf oh my word. with such pain and I knew I couldn't walk and I sat down oh no. and that's where my Camino started, let it go, let it, let it happen, let your heart not, not be troubled and I said but I, you don't understand, you don't understand, I, I trained, I, 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 I've taken three months, I, I've spent X amount of money, that, that will be my first thing, they cost him off in getting me here. Where am I going to sleep? Will they allow me to sleep if I don't walk on the Camino? It just went on and on and on. That was the start of my Camino. Oh, my word. And so I had to come to realize that I have to let go of all my preconceived ideas. And so I, no X amount of kilometers per day? Would... No. I had to... I was the slowest person on that Camino for very long. And those were very important days because I dreamt and I dreamt and I dreamt. I had dreams that were so significant and I couldn't rush. I, I literally had to go and sit in churches because that was the warmest place to sit. Um, it was wonderful and I learned, one of the things I learned was that, oh I've learned so much, but the one thing was 
the angels that appear on our road in life. And if we only have eyes and ears for the moment to allow that, mm. how much we can receive. And then another thing I learned is that you can complete the Camino and you can never get, you can get to the Finister, which is the end of the Camino. And they, in the old days, that they believed when you got there, you will fall off the earth. You can get <laughs> to Finister and you can never reach Finister in your heart. Or you can reach Finister without actually physically having been there. Okay. It, it, it was very the task, the doing it as a, 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 people walk that for very different reasons. But for me as a spiritual journey, it, it was an incredible, incredible journey. Because I, I had to walk towards myself. I had to, I thought it was going to be walking towards God. And I was sitting in one <laughs> cathedral in the oh, cold. Oh, what a difference. So what time of the year did you do this? I did you say April. April. In okay, April, so it was yeah. end of winter. Yeah, and, and, and we had quite a cold spell. So I was sitting in a church cold, and I said, God, where are you? And I just felt, no, 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 no. It's not where am I, it's where are you, Corey? Ah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not where am I, it's where are you? Yeah, he said, yeah. one AA meeting in Kilworth has a sign on the wall that says, um, if you're distant from God, who moved? Oh, gosh. I love that. I will never, ever forget it. So this is very much the answer you got. It's kind of, I'm here. Where are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fabulous. Today I see you. The picture that I have of you is this amazing person who gives so much to the recovery community in Cape Town. How do you see yourself spiritually today? You know, if I just, thank you for that, uh, and it is true, I, I need to acknowledge that. The other thing is so much has been given to me. I could not have planned going to America to study. I mean, I mean, so I have received so much that there was grace, so much grace, so much uh, that I have received that, and in my work, uh, it, I'm so inspired, uh, really, really, really inspired. So, yes, I, I give a lot, but I receive a tremendous amount. I also don't have kids, and I think that has freed me up to... to yes, you, it, it can go into the negative overwork and not living and all that stuff and just working and I'm very So how will the two Yorkies feel if they hear oh, you don't have kids? <laughs> they will feel very, very... Um... Make sure they don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And they do get me out, hey? They do because they demand their walks. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Mm. Good, I'm glad They're part of the healthy part, yes. Awesome. And they hear all the stories. <laughs> and my cat is also a therapy cat. So the amount of... Story, sessions right. he's been in and step work with sponsees yeah he just lies on my, little, on my lap and listen to another step four and i think oh my god the trauma that this cat is getting <laughs> through, all of, through all of this i always find it interesting how the dogs respond and how who they choose to show love and yes. affection because of course we will know our animals when they give a bit more or when they are especially connecting. Yeah. I always find that Tyson has the thing that he will lie on my lap and when a client cries, he will jump off and go lie with the client. Oh, yeah. Except for one client, he, a male, an alcoholic male who came in and from day one, he lay on his lap. Oh. He loved that man. Oh, oh. And one day the man walked in and was in a very bad mood. And Tyson walked in and he sniffed him and he jumped on my lap. And the oh. guy said, even the cat doesn't want to be with me. <laughs> even and the I cat thought, don't love me anymore. Thought, Maybe this is such a good idea to have the cat in the, in the therapy sessions. <laughs> but Corey, let's end here because I, I get the feeling we can sit and have a cup of tea and chat mm. until late night. Mm. But this is awesome. Mm. I really, really appreciate you chatting with us. And um, please keep on just doing the amazing work that you mm, do. Mm, thank you. Thank and I'm you, starting really. to think maybe to talk to you about taking me under your wing. Or at least to get a date for your dolphin uh, swim. Ah, 
I'm afraid of water. <laughs> Corey, enjoy your dolphin swim. Thank you. Thank and may you that may just add another level to your spirituality. I think that they are such amazing animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To connect with them, oh God, I'm so jealous now. Yeah. It took you a few years. Did Why so many years? I'm slow. <laughs> I just I've, say, I've got the desires of the dolphins, but I'm really a whale. <laughs> it doesn't matter how slow you are, you're still further than the guy lying on the couch. I love that saying. Look after yourself. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I find Corey to be such an inspiration. She's surely had her share of hard times in her life, but she is an incredible example of someone who decided that she's worth the hard journey into healing. During our chat, I got the feeling that Corey has come to embrace both the dark and light side of her being. She has learned to walk through the dark, nearly befriending it, to see what she can learn from it, and then, when she comes into the light, she has the experience of the dark to enhance the light. If you want to know more about what I do, please feel free to connect with me on my website, which is www.freddy.org.za, or find me on Facebook at either Meet Me in the Field, or Freddy Counselor, or Freddy van Rensburg, or on Twitter at at Rensburg Freddy, or Instagram at Freddy Counselor. Remember that Freddy is always spelt with an IE at the end. I want to thank Corey for her time and for sharing her journey with Meet Me in the Field. Thank you for listening. Be safe. Bye.